Thank you very much, Jessica, for the invitation and to all of you for attending. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here to open the series uh, of these uh, seminar series. Um, it, I will present uh, some observations um, that arise from my collaborations with colleagues at University College London who are very much interest, interested in policy evaluation. So I'm quite new to the field. And so um, uh, maybe my observation may appear to you more expert than me, uh, quite naive, but I think it's nice to refresh them, even if they're um, quite, um, quite basic. This is work in collaboration with several people at UCL. You see some names down there, in particular Vincent, Kate, Lorraine, Ruth, Katie, and Catherine. They all have, all together, we have lots of discussions that have led to this presentation. The title, as you can see, is Target Trial Emulation for Policy Evaluation, Potentials and Challenges. And it's quite daunting to talk about this to an audience such as yours or with the connections uh, and the eminent people working, working with you. But my perspective will be really one of providing insight from a practitioner point of view. And as I just said, I don't need to say to you how important and how widely spread the application of target trial emulation is, in particular, when, when evaluation um, question, we're evaluating questions that concern treatments in, 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 in the real world. So treatment in, in, pharmaco, uh, in the area of pharmacoepidemiology. The approach is inspired by the rigor with which randomized controlled trials are designed and conducted. In particular, the, 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 the point of, 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 uh, of, of that rigor is to avoid, um, avoid mistakes in particular, avoid mistakes in the data manipulation and transparency in, uh, in posing the question and trying to address them. And at the core of this approach is sort of the adoption of the uh, practice of writing a protocol before any data are collated or any data are analyzed. And that such protocols usually consist of these seven components that I've listed here uh, in, in this table. And, and as I've just said, having this protocol ahead of data manipulation, ahead of data analysis, forces one to be transparent in the questions that they, they ask and in the targets of estimation. Avoids data manipulation errors, such as, for example, backdating the uh, exposure uh, to a time at the start of follow-up when the exposure may have set up later on, as therefore avoiding immortal time bias, or avoiding errors such as including individuals which are already exposed uh, when the object, object of the study is uh, the impact of new, um, new exposure, new onset of exposures, so therefore incidence versus prevalent exposure. And finally, uh, and this is probably the the novelty with respect to what is usually done in epidemiology, well, good epidemiologists always design their study very carefully, think of the eligibility criteria and the follow-up, but what usually standard epidemiology does not do is to set up in advance the analysis plan and the targets of estimation. And therefore, adopting this approach certainly avoids the temptation, at least, to, to do data mining and trying to find some interesting results from the data one has. So as you know, so these are the advantages, but um, we may agree on, on sort of this general definition, but there have been several criticisms to the approach, to the framework in general. The approach has been called naive in many ways because maybe in some application, there has been an underappreciation of the impact of unmeasured confounding as application have been sort of always tended to assume that there is no un, no, no, unme no unmeasured confounding and the four adopted estimation methods that are call upon that assumption. And it's also been accused of being naive in the sense that often the, so these seven steps are followed without much really thinking or consultation with the expert. But I think that's those are criticisms which are easily uh, addressed and answered back by a careful design of the protocol. The probably more uh, important criticism has been that the approach is restrictive. It's restrictive in the sense that to adopt the approach, one should um, think of contrasts or questions that involve contrasts between well-defined interventions. 
but not not all interventions are uh, well definable. For example, in environmental epidemiology, how do you define exposure to pollution? Is it exposure to pollution today, tomorrow, for a month, in this location where you live, where you go to work? And what about other more complex exposure, like the ones that I will discuss in a moment? So there's been a lot written recently about it. And if you want sort of to be up to date with the debate at the moment, I would highly recommend looking at the September issues of epidemiology that has a few contributions on this. But the topic of today, really, policy uh, evaluation of policies really falls under this potential bracket of having to deal with uh, complex exposure. And this is what I will talk about now. I will consider what are the challenges in adopting this approach in the field of health policy evaluation, consider possible conclusion, possible solutions, and go to some conclusions. I don't plan to speak for too long and uh, so to, to leave time for discussion. So I'm, I'm going to go quite quickly, hopefully, um, the this would not arise would not give rise to many questions in the chat but i think um anthony will will tell me so uh, we are talking about target trial emulation in policy evaluation so there have been recent contributions in this field i've got some references there and what those contributions really have highlighted is that there are many complexities in trying to answer questions of policy evaluation using observational data. Of course, there are trials designed to deal with uh, policy evaluations. They are usually small. They are usually restricted in, in, in the range of, uh, of population address. And therefore, as always, there is a need to assess those policies, and likewise uh, treatment within uh, the, the real world application. So the, the complexities are there. We need to deal with them in the observational setting. The applications of those papers referred there also shows, show that there, there are challenges in using data to answer these questions because the data are not as clean as pharmacopoeia databases, for example, made out of claims data. They're usually linked databases where they, there are social, economics, uh, behavioral health records put together in order to appreciate whether a certain policy works or not. But so these are sort of the negative, the challenges. But I think what uh, those papers really highlighted to me is how, what the advantages of entering into this field is how much we have to learn from, or we could learn from econometricians and vice versa, I must say. So there are many methods falling under the panel data methods that uh, have similarities with what we do in epidemiology, but have such, some subtle differences and uh, which, uh, which, which could be advantageous if learned. If we understand each other's language, a lot is there to be learned. So what I'm going to do now is to review some of these issues inspired by my current collaborations with my colleagues at UCL. And of the seven elements of the protocol, I, I will sort of consider examples of challenges on four of them, those in red. And I'll start now. And in fact, to... Um, to represent this, I've just realized maybe you don't see the heading of my slides. Um, to to sort of justify my discussion, I will talk about two exemplars uh, that come from these collaborations of uh, policy evaluations that we are trying to address. The first one concerned health visiting for newborn babies. So the, in England, there is a universal service with mandated contacts uh, from health visitors, so trained um, clinical uh, staff that contacts that are offered to every family and every child, any newborn child. And, and those contacts will be advising on, on breastfeeding, on sleeping and other things, but they're usually, uh, with, they're limited in number. But for, for certain setting instead of family, there are additional non-mandated contacts provided obviously in response of family needs, and also in, depending on resources, and, uh, and, that, and that will lead to quite a spread of geographical variation in the provision of these non-mandated contacts. What is not clear, and my colleagues want to answer, is whether these additional contacts impacts on the health of the targeted baby and the mother, but for the moment, I'm just uh, going to talk about the health of the babies. So, and, and considering how, and, and I, I you know, unequally spread they are, this is quite a difficult question to answer. The second example I'm, I'm sort of more familiar with is sort of been working on this for a, 
uh, for more than a year with my colleagues, and this concerns special education needs provision. So again, in England, uh, more than one in three children receives extra education provision while at school, and a substantial fraction of these children for, to whom SN, for short of special education needs, is offered have health needs such as uh, some um, congenital malformation like Down syndrome or cleft lip and palate abnormalities that would influence the speech ability of the children and therefore the special education needs will uh, help them communicate with their peer and therefore learn and or communicate about their health status. Again, it's unclear whether such provision improves the health of these children in need. So their children were, were in need of special education provision and, and, and the reason why they are in need are um, medical. And this is these are sort of the two areas in which we are working. What they have in common, these two um, policy questions, are that the question is of the type, does the policy improve the health outcome of the children who should receive it, and that's a difficult question. Who, who are, who, who is our target population? Who should receive it, and does the policy improve uh, their health? And what is the policy? The question is that the policy in both examples is delivered a varying level of intensity, and which depends on the needs, but also depends on the local resources. Therefore, um, a lot of clustering and variation depending on how the policy is delivered. How we are addressing these two questions is using a, new, a great new resource called eChild, which is a, a new study set up at UCL in the last few years, which is now expanding and it's, uh, it's accessible to other researchers as well. So if you want to find out more, visit the uh, website by searching on UCL eChild. Now a few words about eChild. So eChild uh, stands for Education and Child Health Insights from Linked Data. It's linked records, it consists of linked records holding longitudinal information on their education, their health and the social care on all pupils in England between 97 and 2019. These are 16 million children. Talking to a Swedish audience, well, some of, uh, of the Swedish audience, you have access to this type of data. You have had access to this type of data for years uh, uh, with different degrees of completeness, I imagine. So you, you're well aware of that. The difference between this type of data, which is finally sort of more available in the UK, is that we don't have a unique identifier as you do. So there are several issues about linkage, uh, because linkage is either a combination of deterministic and probabilistic, and depends on information on certain fields, uh, which usually are date of birth, name, um, and uh, look at, uh, area, of, area of residence and sex. Considering um, that um, it, based on this information, you can imagine how many type typos there may be, especially in the names, and especially for certain um, ethnic groups. So that's there are issues that I will uh, expand on in a moment, but just sort of flagging the difference between the Swedish and the UK system. So this, this diagram simply shows how so information on from schools which are held in the national pupil database. It, this is a huge database, yearly data. So therefore the longitudinal information that inf includes information on all children attending state schools. About five to seven percent of children in the UK attend private school and they're informed at some point in their life. And this database does not include information on private school, children educated in private institution. On the other side, this is linked to the hospital episode statistics, which includes medical records on starting from birth records, maternal records, which are linked. So you have information on the mother and the child and also information of any hospital in, in, in hospital attendance, outpatient hospital attendance, uh, accident and emergency, they can all be linked. So we can reconstruct a history of uh, medical, a medical history for the children and, and as well as their uh, school records. And in, in small letter here it says that 97% of births are captured by HES for short of hospital episode statistics, and the majority of them are linked to their mother's record. And we are in the process of linking these two major databases with other social care, um, employment and income data sets. So it's, it's an expanding um, 
project led by Katie Harron and Ruth Gilbert, who are two other people mentioned at the start of my slide. So these are the data. And now I'm going to talk about the challenges in using this data to answer those two questions. And there are three groups of challenges. The first one is the first item of the protocol, which is eligibility. We define a target population from these linked administrative data. Say that I'm looking at the health um, visitors um, project, and I want to identify all children born between 2016 and 2019 and see how their health visiting uh, experience has been. Well, the first thing I need to notice is that uh, although so in orange I'll have all the birth in that period, each child will only identify those who are born in hospital. So uh, there's a fraction, relatively small, but possibly varying over time of children who will not be included in my in my database. On top of that, if I want to link their experience to their education outcomes, for example, my has my e child will not include any children who are exclusively educated privately. So there is some selection bias, got selection going there. Finally, because as I mentioned, the linkage is done with um, both via probabilistic and, and deterministic link, there will be linkage error with miss mislinkages as well as erroneous linkages. So my each child will include a, not exactly what I want, but as apologies for this, if you can see it, um, but a, a, a different combination. Finally, um, if I already find finally number two, if in in my second example, the one that looks at children in need, uh, children with their health needs who and, and their uh, special education exposure, within HES, I will want to identify them. And within HES, I may be able to identify all of them because of their hospital attendance, but not all of them, if the condition I'm considering is one which is dealt with in primary care instead of secondary or tertiary care. So there will be some, some of the children in my target population which will not be identified in my, uh, in my database. So this is just to say, so in awareness, uh, that there will be selection bias in even in this large you know, um, representative uh, database, uh, which is an immense resource, one needs to be uh, completely aware of the sources of selection bias that occur. And depending on this on the application, there will have to be a careful understanding of the source of those. And, and this is where I believe our collaboration with the data scientists, which really look after these databases, is fundamental because they know exactly the extent of the linkage error of the ways of, of producing or, or, or examining the linkage error, and they have an ability, and as well as, uh, so I'd say data scientists, but also clinicians who will help us understand which conditions are well captured or not by our database. So this is it for sort of challenge number one. And I move to challenge number two, which is a bit more, probably more interesting, uh, but also more complex. I'm referring back to example one, uh, which is the um, health visitors question. Does, does it help uh, the children who need uh, access support? And what we want is to compare universal service, which is health visiting at birth and at six to eight weeks versus additional visit in infancy. And the outcome we are interested in is unplanned hospitalization in infancy. And this diagram tries to represent what's going on. So I, by looking at sort of the trajectory, observed trajectories of a bunch of children, I can say that there is a group of unexposed children who have their mandated um, health visiting um, delivered to them. And then they have some hospitalization here during their first year of life. And there is another group of children which had the mandatory, mandatory one, as well as some additional one at certain time, they could, times. They could be before or after, only before uh, a hospital admission or, or a unplanned hospital admission. Let me just sort of uh, study it quite quickly, but it's important to say unplanned in the sense that it's not part of routine care of these children. It's some emergency that had occurred that could have been avoided by the intervention of the health visitor. So what are we to do with this uh, 
with this um, with this type of data, with this type of question. It's obvious that this is an example of a complex uh, policy because there isn't a clear definition of what the uh, intervention is. Could be additional visits all within the first six months, could be spread out, could be regular, could be irregular, we don't know. There isn't a written policy that we can refer to. So uh, this is a case where the intervention is not well defined. And the other complication is that could be concurrent with the outcome. So the outcome may lead to more in, uh, visit from the, from the health visitor. So what are we to do? Well, there are three options I want to consider and just simply to inspire us to think of what is the implication of adopting one approach relative to another. So option one, we select time zero for defining who is eligible to enter in this target trial and also time zero for treatment assignment. So that's, we know that everybody should have their visit by six to eight weeks. Let's round it to three months. And this is the line I have here. And then we can say that that's the time that we open up a window in, during which treatment could be, the additional treatment could be received or not. So there's, let's call it a grace period, a month during which the, in, in our target trial emulation, some people will be randomized to receive extra visits without specifying how many and when, but some people will not. And in this sort of idealized uh, sort of, uh, emulation of the target trial, we'll, we'll have data looking like this, where there are the follow-up starts at four months at the end of the grace period, people are assigned to expose or unexpose, and then we look at the occurrence of their hospital unplanned hospitalization. Of course, some of these in the unexposed group may have additional visits, but this is like departure for uh, from randomized treatment. But if we are interested in, in intention to treat, we will uh, analysis, we would keep this group as unexposed. While the exposed will be once they receive some uh, visit during the month between three and four months. And we would compare these two groups. Note that one earlier exposed, the ones that initially are ahead in the exposed group has now moved up here because the first um, health visitor visit was after four months in my, uh, sort of, I, in my drawing. So this is option one. And we could obviously repeat this exercise for different time zeros. And of course, repeat this at four months and look at a window between four and five months to, uh, to give the yeah, treatment assignment with follow-up starting at five months and so forth, and therefore create a sequence of target trials, which is something which has been done in many applications in pharmacoepidemiology, such as in when evaluating the effect of HRT on cardiovascular outcome. So this is one option, but I, th I think the complication and the difference here from standard pharmacoepi is that the intervention is not that clearly defined. It's still very vaguely defined. It's, it's not, yes, HRT started during that particular month. This is a number of visits received, and the number of visits is a combination of whatever is in the data. So that we need to be careful. It's still not very very clearly defined. And also we may suffer from some selection bias because people need to survive uh, the time in which we sort of set the starting point for the follow-up. Option two is much simpler. It simply says, let's treat treatment as a baseline exposure, select a time point, for example, six months and se separate people according to their past. Did they receive uh, only the baseline uh, in, number of visits, or did they um, receive extra visits? And this is now we have the two groups defined like this, but having, for example, uh, um, subjectively chosen six months as the threshold for defining the exposure status, I start probably suffering from selection bias because some people do not make it to the six months. They, they probably have... Um, they die or they, um, after hospitalization. So there could be some selection bias in results applying only to the survivors, the six month survivors, which is partly the in, in, impacts on option one, two, but uh, here I've chosen a later window just to highlight this possibility. Option three, 
is to do the cloning and censoring. This means for every child we have, we treat their follow-up time information as compatible to both exposure and non-exposure status up to the time when they, um, they are not compatible anymore. So this individual here um, had the two, this child here had the two statutory visits and then had an additional visit here. But up to that point, we could have treated that particular child as unexposed for this duration of follow-up. While for the rest, while the exposed period uh, would have, would have um, included that period, so there, there could be other exposed or unexposed for as far as we know, but then the rest will be under the exposed status. And we repeat this cloning and censoring for each child. Obviously, in the analysis, the censoring will have to be dealt with appropriately. So why am I looking at these three options? Because discussing with my colleagues, we, we, we're trying to decide which one is the right one. What do we get by using one or the other? So I'm just reviewing what questions we address in these three options. Options one sets up put, could set up a sequence of trials. Uh, for example, the, 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 the sort of bigger version of, of option one. And, it, it, and, and that would allow to ask, would adding visits at month at the fourth during the fourth month or during the fifth month or during the sixth month would add in that visit in that time interval that we've defined defined influence the rate of unplanned hospitalization. Option two instead would simply say is would further health visits up to six months influence the rate. So it's a slightly different question. It's a it's a question that looks at the cumulative effect up to six months in the survivors. Um, While well before in option one, we're just saying, would this, this intervention during the fourth month, the intervention in the fifth month, the intervention in the sixth month, would I each individually make a difference? We could obviously take an average of those and do something simpler, but this the underlying question is that. Option three, the clone and censoring, is it asks yet another question. It says, would additional visit at any time influence the rate. We are not specifying the time. We just say, would the extra visit influence the rate? Maybe in the way I've set it up, would one additional visit, I should say, uh, influence the rate of unplanned hospitalization? So concluding from this, simple message, the question will inform the, our data manipulation because we need to choose the question first um, before we sort of consider how to deal with this problem. And hence the uh, the title here, the impact on questions and estimates that uh, possible solutions are. Now I'll move on to my last challenge. And for that, I'll use the second example. So I'll just the sec second example, and just because uh, the information is delivered very quickly, I just put here a little reminder of what exemplar two deals with. This is the slide we've just seen, exemplar Two says in England, more than one in three children receive extra education provision. A substantial fraction of these children have health needs, such as Down syndrome and cleft lip and palate abnormalities. I will we are looking at many of them as part of the program, but I will show you some results for the subgroup of children who are affected by abnormalities of cleft lip and palate, because we expect the um, special education need provision to help their uh, verbal uh, skills and therefore their ability to ask for help. So the, the, there is sort of a causal, the, there is an ex a possible mechanism through which the SEN, special education need, could influence um, their health outcomes. So more specifically, so we are looking at, so now I'm talking about analysis plan as our last challenge in the, in the seven point protocol. The population is made of children affected by cleft lip and palate abnormalities that we have identified in each child. And because this is usually something which is dealt with in hospital, we expect to identify not to suffer from selection bias on the particular uh, condition, health condition. So we, we, should, we shouldn't be too concerned about that possible source of selection bias. And the intervention we are looking at to begin with, but we are going to do more, is whether special education needs provision during the first year of compulsory education, year one, will influence, will affect the rate of hospitalization. Um, I haven't written it yet, but it's in the next slide, the rate of hospitalization during primary school. 
But before I talk about the outcome, I need to say something more about the intervention, because there is a huge complication in which, with which the treatment, the intervention is delivered. So the assignment to SEN is complex and extended over, over time. So it's not, again, we have this problem that there is a window of time when the policies is produced. And here there's a diagram that tries to describe this. So although compulsory education starts at year one in England, uh, I think in the UK, the majority of children, especially in the last 15 or 20 years, go to school at rece in reception, so at age five, uh, four and a half and five. It's not compulsory, but some children will start receiving special education needs, special education needs support then. So there are some people who turn up in year one, which are prevalent, exposed to three, uh, we're sp speak, talking about three levels of exposure, absolutely no provision, no SEN. And just for the sake of this seminar, without giving you all the detail, there is a, a low level of provision and a high level of provision, which are this, sort of these three levels. So we're really interested in it's in, at, in, in year one, but we realize that for many children, the assignment starts earlier. And the assignment has different uh, mechanisms. In reception, the children who end up receiving the high level of exposure are those who, are, who have medical needs. So comorbidities, um, conditions such as um, down syndromes of uh, cleft lip and palate will lead to, re to starting reception already uh, with a high level of intensity. In, but uh, if you are in reception, and we're the majority, you also, during, recept during the year of reception, you, you, are, you sit a test. It's called the early years test. There is a much longer name, but there is a test. And depending on that test, the rest of the children will probably receive either high or low, those who are not medically in need. So what ends up, what we end up is, this is only a sort of pictorial representation of what happens. It's not true to the data because our, there are issues about exporting the information. So this is sort of, it's a picture of what, how the data look like, but it's not exactly the data. But you can see here with this fluvial plot, what happens to these children? The, the color code goes from no sen a reception to low level of SEN or high level of SEN. And here you see that the majority of the kids who are in high level of SEN in year one were already high level in, 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 uh, in reception. Those with low level may switch after uh, to high or may even go lower. And some who are none, but a good chance, go to low level of SEN. And this is a, these are consequences of the test. So the Medical conditions will lead to this split here, but the test results will lead to this split here. So we have two separate mechanisms over an interval of time. We have an in incident. So the incident low level will be the pink one. The incident high level will only be a couple of them here. So it's, it's complicated. We have that high is established in reception, low is established in year one, and we have this mixture. So what can we do? What, what are the consequences of this mixture of, of uh, processes leading to, to the exposure? And, and what should we do if we want to relate this exposure to an outcome, which is unplanned hospitalization during primary school? Again, a pictorial representation, simplified representation of what goes on. And now you can see the dilemma at play. Given that it's a mix of prevalent and incident cases of uh, sort of square framed the exposure now over a year of time from reception to year one, where I count for the processes, which are the comorbidities influencing receiving high, early years uh, influencing receiving either of this. But the important thing is that the sort of the, the, the difficulty that we have is that whether you receive SEN in reception will influence your test. And therefore, early years becomes in a way, is on the pathway from the earlier intervention to the later intervention. It's sort of part of the story. On the other hand, early year test is a confounder in the sense that it is associated, well, it's a sort of a confound, it's associated with background um, confounders, 
and it's it, it influences uh, the uh, the exposure, and therefore there's a backdoor path open towards the outcome, which is unplanned hospitalization, as well as all the others. So the question for us now is one. Is it right to ask a question that concerns incident and prevalence exposure? Well, we expand the window, we say, we classify children according to their histories in a way. But the next thing is, which confounder should we control for? Because it, although earlier test, which is a very, very strong predictor of, of the exposure, is on the pathway to, com to confound it, that it, in this diagram is already blocked by some things we measure, but what if there is a U here some other factor that influences your performance, maybe behavioral difficulties, which will also influence unplanned hospitalization. So should we control or should we not control for this variable, which is nearly an, an instrument in a sense, uh, because it's so strong, this relationship here. So should you control or not control? Um, now some results and then I conclude. So I'll leave you, I don't have an answer. Um, we, we are debating. We, we spend many, many meetings debating whether we should control or not, or what it means to control for it. It would be nice to hear your views. But I'll just give you some sense of the data. These are results which are exported, so I can share. So as I already said, there are three levels of exposure, and um, we realize that there are huge issues of positivity um, because children are so different. So there is no way of comparing no... SEM with versus high SEM. Those two populations do not share uh, a, pro a propensity of receiving uh, either treatment. So we have split a comparison between low versus none. And there is good overlap, good results. Uh, I mean, uh, no major issues in the sense that there is no association between low SEM and unplanned hospital hospitalization, whether or not you control for uh, the test results. The difficulty comes here with comparing high level of, um, unfortunately, my dynamics not working very well, but you can imagine the curve underneath. We are comparing high versus low, where the propensity score distribution is uh, for the unexposed is like this, and the exposed is sort of flat over here. Sorry that I've not checked that the dynamics didn't work. So, but the, the point is there is poor overlap between those who receive high level of exposure and those who receive low. So we try to understand why, where, who are the children who have zero probability of receiving or who have one probability one of, rec of, of receiving the high level of exposure. We realize that those who, we realize some of them are and we've excluded them. And those are the children who go to special school in reception. Of course, they are identified earlier as in, in great need. So we we have sort of we deal with that up to a point. But the point sort of to share with you is that when policies are not targeted universally, the the so the health the health visitor one could be targeted universally. But this one, special education needs the very high provision, is not targeted universally. You need to, you would expect very poor overlap. And therefore that would influence what questions you, you can ask. So that's a sort of some policy side of the problem. And now I'm going to show you some results just for, and then I'll conclude. Uh, um, don't worry about the number of slides. There are many additional slides for your questions there. Um, the um, Some quick exam, uh, analysis, result uh, estimates of um, average effect in the treaty. So the question is, are those who received high level of special education needs uh, taking an advantage of receiving and would they lose out if they were not receiving it? Um, so what is the impact? Sorry, I'll, I'll rephrase. What is the impact of receiving high level of SEN versus not receiving among those who received it among the treated after excluding those in special school to improve the overlap and excluding early years test results as a, as a uh, predictor. And we find out that there seemed to be an indication of harm overall, but then because the reason for receiving the, treat the treatment, which is high SEN, is really established in reception and is established um, because of, of medical reason, we looked at whether there are some interactions with severity of disease. 
And it turns out that one particular group of children, those who have um, the malform malform malformation in the palate, therefore they have greater difficulties of speaking, are those the ones for which, for whom there seem to be a significant um, harmful effect of the treatment, which is quite confusing. But on the other hand, you know, there are also those who have greater need of hospitalization. And this is excluding early year of tests. But if early, year, early years is a strong confounders, what happens if included? That impact seems to be moderated. So I'm not going to sort of say any more because we're still battling with interpretation. But you can see that there are big issues in understanding the mechanism leading to the exposure. And there are still question marks we need to resolve with the clinicians about what it means to have unex unexpected expected, unplanned hospitalization. So last summary, I try to talk, to talk, to share with you the concerns we're having while working on, on policy evaluation questions, uh, which concern three major topics, eligibility, specification of intervention and estimates and analysis planned. With regard to eligibility, we've talked about selection bias from using admin linked administrative data and the message is consult the data expert and interact very much with the subject matter expert. Otherwise, it won't make any sense of whether your uh, available data are represented in any way or can you sort of uh, use that information in any way. The specification of the intervention on the estimate, it's again, understand the question. I think every, you know, every causal inference talk you may go is we always talk about clarify the question. This is sort of trying to give a a, a take, which is to do more specifically, we, even within a quite specific question, how many sub-questions you can have and how you can choose them. And, to, and with regard to analysis plan, I can't say very much about our results. The important message is that there is a complex confounding pattern because of the extent to which the exposure is, is delivered and selected. Uh, we obviously are replicating the results using alternative approach using Difference in difference that I haven't shown, but they have other difficulties that I'm not going to, to mention, such as parallel trends and the hospitalization in childhood, in infancy and in, in school are very different and they're not very parallel. So uh, what do you do with an assumption which is not met there either? And of course, lots of sensitivity analysis. So conclusions, estimating the health effect of policies is practical. It's an important in, uh, endeavor. There is a lot of pressure from the Department of Health and Department of Education towards my colleagues to come up with some answers. Combining the fra framework of target trial emulation with linked data and educational anonymized administrative data enables the emulation of policy relevant questions, but this is not without difficulties and um, complexities. Um, as I say last year, several subtle challenges are there and they need to be addressed. So we should never overinterpret the results we may get. So thank you very much for listening. And it's, uh, it's I hope I haven't taken too much of your time. And I should show this as well for the results that I've shown and the references here. Thank you very much, Bianca. Um, I'm going to just take